Hi there, I'm Michelle Kittleson, a Professor of Medicine at the Smith Heart Institute at Cedars Sinai, and I'm delighted to talk to you about racial and ethnic disparities in cardiac amyloidosis. I have no disclosures. So when we think about disparities, uh, we have to think about what are social determinants of health. And this is a beautiful figure from a fantastic review article that appeared in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which talks about the five domains of the social determinants of health, neighborhood and built environment, economic stability, education, social and community context, healthcare access and quality, and how these markers have direct and indirect effects on the health and well-being health outcomes. So as we think about amyloidosis, as I proceed through my talk, think about these factors through the lens of the social determinants of health. So let's start with a quick overview of cardiac amyloidosis. It is a condition whereby a protein infiltrates the myocardium, resulting in a restrictive cardiomyopathy. The two most common sources of the protein will be light chains, that would be AL cardiomyopathy, or the TTR protein, transthyretin cardiomyopathy. And the TTR protein in turn has one of two sources, a mutation in the gene, that's the variant form, or wild type, which is the wild type form, it used to previously be called senile cardiac amyloidosis, though we don't use that terminology anymore because it hurts people's feelings. And then when you think about the amyloid protein, it's important to recognize that it can go places other than the heart, that there can be infiltration with neuropathy, nephropathy uniquely in AL cardiomyopathy, gastrointestinal involvement, as well as orthopedic musculoskeletal issues. And that's often the clue to diagnosis. So when we're thinking about the disparities, it's important to recognize certain unique features of cardiac amyloidosis. Fact 1A, the diagnosis can be tricky. And heart failure symptoms, while classic, are often the tip of the iceberg and a late finding. What we can also see are things like fatigue and other cardiac findings, atrial fibrillation, AV block pacemaker, aortic stenosis, and HEFPEF can coexist with amyloidosis, increased wall thickness with discordant voltage. The neurological findings can include a sensory neuropathy, autonomic dysfunction with intolerance to vasodilators, and as we talked about, the orthopedic findings such as carpal tunnel and spinal stenosis. So we can't just think of the tip of the iceberg, we have to think about the other findings. Fact 1B, there can be more than one diagnosis. In fact, when you look at patients with their ECG findings, you can see that less than 40% of patients actually have classic low voltage on ECG. Many of these patients just might have discordant voltage. What about patients admitted with heart failure, with preserved ejection fraction. If you take these patients with heart failure symptoms, preserved ejection fraction, and increased wall thickness on echocardiogram, you see amazingly 13% of them thought to just have garden variety HEFPEF have amyloidosis, which would be a missed opportunity for disease-directed therapy. What about patients with severe aortic stenosis undergoing transcatheter aortic valve implantation? Well, if you study these patients, you find that 16% of them have underlying amyloidosis. So if you stop at one diagnosis, you might miss the opportunity for disease-directed therapy. The next fact I want you to remember is that the TTR variant is prevalent in Black Americans. This is a spectrum of variants that you may see in patients. And let's look at the V142I mutation, which has predominant cardiac features, and 3.4% of Black Americans carry this variant. Now, that does not mean that 3.4% of patients 
will manifest disease. There is incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. However, these patients do require a high index of suspicion when they present with heart failure symptoms and increased LV wall thickness, which may not be due to hypertension, but rather an infiltrative disease. Another fact to remember is that when you have these patients with transthyroidin cardiac amyloidosis, earlier treatment is better. This is a classic figure from the ATTR ACT trial, the pivotal trial that showed the benefit of tefamidus in helping patients live longer and stay out of the hospital. But we have to think about how tefamidus works. It doesn't reverse disease, it prevents progression. And you have to be on it for a while to see a benefit. That's why the survival curves take 18 months before they actually separate, before you actually see a benefit. The earlier you start the patient on it, the better. Also look at subgroup analysis. The less symptomatic the patient, the more benefit you will see. So we need to have an early diagnosis so that patients will accrue benefit and feel better for longer. So when we think about racial disparities in cardiac amyloidosis, we have a perfect storm. It's common in Black Americans. The diagnosis is challenging, and there are risks of delayed therapy. These disparities are not just theoretical, in fact. They have been observed in practice. We know that Black Americans with ATTR, cardiac amyloidosis, do worse. This is a study comparing those with the variant form, the V122I mutation, 100% of those are African American, versus the wild type, none of those were African American. The mortality was strikingly higher in those patients with the variant form, and they were at greater risk of cardiovascular hospitalization. But you might ask yourself, is this biology? Maybe there's something special about V122I, or is it truly disparity? Well, this study answers that question because it takes Black versus white Americans with the same mutation. They found a group of Italian Americans who actually had the V122I mutation, and you can see that even when you compare the same mutation in Blacks versus whites, Black patients do differently. Lower blood pressure, worse kidney function, smaller LV sides, lower stroke work. And what we don't know is were white individuals diagnosed earlier in the disease course? Do Black individuals have more severe disease biologically? Or are they more vulnerable to delays in diagnosis? There are a lot of other examples of disparities as well. If we look at this uh, graph, this figure of where patients are enrolled in clinical trials, these are eight trials by country. Darker red means more trial enrollment. Note that there are no trials enrolling on the African continent, and the percent Black participants in trials is low. 2 to 14 percent, and we cannot change what we do not study and document. So thankfully, we have a trial called SCAN-MP, which is a step in the right direction. This will involve a longitudinal observational cohort, multi-center of 800 percipients, uh, participants of older patients who are Black, Caribbean, Hispanic, increased left ventricular wall thickness, and they will undergo extensive evaluation for cardiac amyloidosis to help us better understand the prevalence, the differences by sex, race, and ethnicity, and to better understand the role of active ascertainment in high-risk populations. So in summary, what do we know and what do we still need to know? We, need to, we know that amyloidosis is more common than you think. You need to have a high index of suspicion in the face of clinical clues. We know this variant, this classic variant, V142 or 122, depending on the nomenclature, is present in 3.4% of Black Americans and earlier treatment leads to better outcomes. We need to know if the differences in outcomes are related to biology or and disparity? And is there a role for active ascertainment in at risk populations like Black Americans?
because it's very important when we think about our patients to not forget about the elephant in the room. We have amyloidosis that is mediated by the risk factors of biology and disparity, because ultimately it isn't just great science that saves lives. The proper equation is great science plus effective implementation equals lives saved. So a better understanding of the science and policies to implement that science will allow us to help the greatest amount of patients. Thanks so much for your attention.